With one heart and voice we pray, Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you reclaimed your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized into Christ faithful in their calling to be your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Numbers, the 11th chapter, page 145 in the Pew Bible. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do it so again. However, two men, whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, page 1144 in the Pew Bible. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still wordly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still wordly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his ha task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. The word of God for the people of God. Our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 3, beginning with verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Selim, because there was plenty of water, and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, 
but God's wrath remains on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We shall remain here, and we will be in the gospel of John. And so uh, before we begin into this text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here, to be together, and the privilege to hear your word. And Holy Spirit, may you take that word and speak it into our very souls. And may we have ears to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before we jump into this, I want to make sure we kind of understand where we're at in this whole story. Uh, This is John chapter 3. We've covered just an amazing amount of ground. I mean, look at all those verses we're doing today, huh? That's kind of impressive. So Jesus has been in Jerusalem. He's had his meeting with, uh, I call it the Nick at night meeting because he met with Nicodemus, a Pharisee at night. And Jesus is now moving out of the city of Jerusalem into the countryside where John the Apostle tells us that he's out baptizing with the disciples. Now we find out in chapter 4 that Jesus himself actually didn't baptize anybody. It was only his disciples doing that. And just down the road somewhere, John the Baptist is baptizing as people are still coming to see him. And apparently some argument rises up between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial washing, which they're probably arguing about the baptisms that were going on. And so John's disciples come to him, and they can't help but point out, they said, hey, the guy back across the Jordan who you've been testifying, look at him. He's getting all the big crowds. Now, I would love to think that maybe this was just a positive affirmation of the situation. You know, maybe, maybe John's disciples were going, woohoo, look, that guy's getting all the big crowds. That's perfect. No, I don't think that was what they were thinking, Um, especially looking at how John responds to them. Instead, it seems that they are pretty jealous of Jesus and jealous for John. And yeah, it's kind of understandable. I think especially to us, we, uh, we live in a very highly competitive culture. You know, I've been watching the NFL playoffs, go Hawks. And it's amazing how these ginormous men are willing to sacrifice their bodies for the purpose of this kind of jealous competition or the millions of dollars they're getting paid. (laughs) Anyways, but you know, it's not just sports where we see this highly competitive nature. I'm sure Pastor Steve would attest to this. Whenever uh, I go to like a pastor's conference, what's the first question every pastor asks the other? So how many people come to your church? They don't say it that like bluntly. They usually try to polish that up a little bit so it doesn't sound like they're just looking for competition. And my standard response now is however many God brings. They don't like that. And it seems as people, we take great pride in being able to kind of draw a crowd, you know, or maybe gain recognition. Or in this age of social media, that would be to obtain followers or friends. And I've noticed when someone outdoes us, we tend to either try harder through work or some form of like manipulation, or we become highly critical of the people who apparently have more success than we do. Oh, they're snobs. Oh, they've cheated. Well, if I had this and that, I could do whatever. Well, today, as we're looking at this response that John the Baptist has to his disciples, it's almost like getting a, a huge breath of fresh air. <sighs> so let's take a look at this. What is it that we notice in John that's different than pretty much everybody else? Well, first thing is a proper attitude. And I think this comes out of a couple very key understandings that John has, or you might just say this is the reason why John the Baptist doesn't get jealous of Jesus. The first thing is he understands God. So this is how he responds to his disciples when they say, look at this guy, he's getting all the big crowds. He says a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. So essentially saying, look, uh, all that we have is what God has given us. So his view is, well, if Jesus is getting more people, 
That's because God is sending more people to Jesus. He doesn't look at this as he's somehow being outdone or outworked. No, simply the fact that God is granting more people to go to Jesus than to him. And with that, he is content. Now, that's kind of a key word in this whole discussion today. It's kind of file that in your head. So he understands God. Secondly, he understands himself. He says, you yourselves can testify that I said I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. John knew that his purpose was simply to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. And so he even goes further and gives them an illustration just to kind of further this point by way of the Jewish wedding. Now, for us, we may not quite understand what he's talking about here. The Jews who were hearing this would have completely understood exactly what he was talking about. He speaks about the friend who attends the bridegroom. So for us, that would essentially be the best man. But in a Jewish wedding, the best man had a lot of responsibilities. First of all, he was the liaison between the bride and the groom. He also basically arranged this whole thing. So this wedding would take place over several days. This was not just a couple hours here or there. No, this was a big deal. And so he would arrange the whole thing. He would even make sure that the invitations were done, that they had been delivered properly. After the ceremony, he would preside over the wedding feast. So he was the one who was responsible to make sure that there was plenty of wine. We've heard what's happened when that didn't take place. He was making sure the caterers had done their job, the centerpieces looked perfect. All those kind of little nitty-gritty details that go into a wedding feast. But then he had this one kind of unusual to our ears, not to them, but this one kind of unusual specific duty that he had to perform. So after all the celebration was done, the ceremony, the feast, the bride would then go off to the bridal chamber where she would await the bridegroom. It was the best man's job then to wait in the dark to open the door for the bridegroom because if any other voice was saying hello, he'd be like, "Mm -mm. no, no, you aren't going in there until he heard the voice of the bridegroom. And then he would open the door and let him into the bride's chambers, and then he would go away rejoicing. There's no jealousy there, no envy, just joy, that knowing that he had done his job of bringing together the bride and the groom. That's why I find it really fascinating that John would use this illustration. Because throughout the Old Testament, God is often pictured as the bridegroom, and the nation of Israel, his bride. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, you realize that bride often betrays, cheats on, leaves her bridegroom. But regardless, John sees himself in the role of this best man, bringing the Messiah, the bridegroom, to the nation, the bride. He's baptized the people to prepare them, Uh, He's pointed out that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He baptized Jesus. He saw the Spirit of God come down and rest upon him. He heard the voice of the Father from heaven. And now he's testifying to the truth of who Jesus is. So John's looking at this and thinking, his work is done. So he can genuinely, wholeheartedly, and honestly say, Now he must become greater, and I must become less. Or as I learned it, he must increase as I must decrease. John never expected anything else. You notice how he never plays into the pride and jealousy that we so often fall into. When his followers point out how everybody is now going to Jesus, you don't hear him say, well, if I was the Messiah... I would be drawing the big crowds too. You know, if I was doing all these miracles, well, I could draw that crowd. No, he never does that. He understands. He rejoices. He says, good, fantastic. I have done the work that I was supposed to do, and now I must, and it's a very emphatic must, become less. It's like saying, "I, I know I'm not the big show anymore. And that's perfect. 
Then the Apostle John kind of reminds us why Jesus must become greater. In verses 31 through 36, he basically says there that, you know what, Jesus isn't like us because he came from heaven. He's above all of us. He does what the Father does. He speaks the truth, even though people don't really want to accept it. He speaks the words of God because unlike the prophets of old who only had a portion of the Spirit for a limited time, Jesus was given the Spirit without measure, without limit. And everything has been placed in his hands. And then the apostle reminds us, this great reminder, that whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Then he follows that with the sober truth, that whoever rejects the Son will only see death and the wrath of God. And John the Baptist, he knew those truths only applied to Jesus. They didn't apply to him. That's why he can so confidently say, I'm not the Messiah, you know that. And I must decrease now as he increases. <sighs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us had that same kind of humility and contentment? Why wouldn't the world just look different? So I think we need to kind of look at what does this mean then for us? Well, let me start by asking you a question. What is it that makes you jealous? You know, what is it that you envy in others? Now, I want you just to think about this for a minute. Was well, it a job? Someone else's income? Maybe it's someone's physical appearance, their family, their children, their success. Maybe it's the fact that maybe they get recognized for something. Because jealousy can arise from all of that. When I was in school, my wife and I took a class together. We didn't take many together because she hated all of my classes. But we took a class on the Old Testament prophets. So we had a big project that we were able to work together on. And she did all this research. She researched all the prophets, all their backgrounds. She wrote papers on all of them. I drew comic book pictures of all the prophets. And I mean, they were, they were just fantastic. Yeah, like Jephthah, he's like ripping open his shirt and he's got this massive hairy chest. And Samson looked like the Incredible Hulk. I mean, these guys were just ridiculously hulking. And the professor loved these drawings. This is going to date me a little bit, but she made overhead copies of all of them to show the class. Never once acknowledging all the work my wife did. <laughs> My wife still doesn't like that whole story. I think she's still a little jealous of the recognition I got for this project, even though I didn't really deserve it. You know, or maybe you've been in a situation where you've been replaced by someone younger, smarter, better looking, funnier. Maybe it's in a relationship, a friendship, a job, who knows. I think what's so hard with jealousy is that it strikes at the very heart of sin because the heart of sin is what? Pride and selfishness. And so I think what this means for us is that it is extremely hard for us not to be jealous and envious of others. Look at our Old Testament lesson. Was Moses jealous that Eldad and Medad, there's some good names you don't hear very often, was he jealous that they were prophesying in the camp when everyone else had stopped? No. No. It's kind of like with John the Baptist and his disciples. Who was the one who was jealous here? It was Joshua. He said, Moses, tell him to knock it off. Moses says, oh, I wish everyone was prophesying. And that's kind of ironic because Joshua is the one who would then eventually replace Moses as the leader of Israel. So then our big question today is how do we combat jealousy? Well, we go right back to the scripture, right back to the the model that John the Baptist has given us, and that it starts with a proper attitude. And that begins, number one, with we must understand God. Understand that all we have, all that anyone has, is from God. He neither gives too much nor too little. He gives exactly as he has determined is best for us. So if someone has more than we do, whether that be in physical things, material things, which are all going to burn anyways, or in gifts, and how people, talents, attributes, those kind of things. If we're looking at other people who have more than us, 
we should be thankful and celebrate. We shouldn't envy, we shouldn't long for what they have, shouldn't criticize them or cut them down, but be thankful. You know, of course, the greatest example we have of this is Jesus himself. And I love how the Apostle Paul captures this in Philippians chapter 2. He says, in your relationships with one another, have this same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So I think that the key things there is that if we want to battle jealousy, the two things we have to have are humility and contentment, which are two very un-American attributes. But if we can grasp the truth that we have only what God has given us, and that goes for everyone else, then we really can't look at others with jealousy. But we have to be thankful for what we do have. And trust that God knows what he's doing, even if it means he's given someone else more. So we must understand God. Secondly, we must understand ourselves. Okay, now this is going to shock you. I wasn't sure if I should say this today. I don't want you falling out of your pews. I don't want any shrieks of disbelief. I... I'm not Jesus. I know it's shocking, right? (laughs) But here's the other thing. Neither are you, okay? And I say this because, as the apostle points out, while Christ did become one of us, he's not like us. In fact, he's unlike anyone else. We are not God in the flesh. We were born sinners in dire need of salvation. Now, that's not to say that we don't matter, because we do. And it's not to say we're not important, because we very much are. In fact, I love, there's a line from a song by Keith and Kristen Getty. I love this. It says, two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. See, friends, since God loved you so much, that he would send his son to die, and I mean suffer and, and more brutally than any human being has ever suffered. Since you are loved that much, then you better believe you are important. But what is it that makes us so important? Well, I think it's the same thing that was so important for John the Baptist. As we point others to Christ... Why else do you have that joy? Why else do you have that hope? Why else do you have this faith? Because you're not the one who came up with it. It's all him. Yeah, it's it's interesting, after a sermon or after a service, I have a hard time sometimes when people come up and say, Pastor, that was a good sermon, or, you know, Corey, that was a great song, or however that may be. And not, I'm not saying don't say that because it's very encouraging and I really appreciate it. But I wish that my response was a little bit quicker to say, it's not me. That's all him. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. You know, Jesus, in Luke chapter 17, when he was speaking about the relationship between the master and the servants and relating it to being a disciple, He said to them, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now, of course, our duty is pretty awesome because it's the privilege of telling others why. If anything good comes from me, I have the privilege of telling people it's not me. That's all him. I must decrease as he must increase. Because, friends, I don't have the power to save. I can't send the Holy Spirit to dwell in anybody. I won't be anyone's judge on Judgment Day. Be thankful for that. I can't grant eternal life to anybody. But I do know the one who can. And I must point others to him. He's the one above all others. 
He alone is the gate to eternal life. He alone can remove God's wrath from our sinful state. He must increase as I must decrease. And here's something that's amazing. God has gifted every single one of us here to fulfill that mission, that purpose. So don't be jealous and look at someone and go, well, they have better gifts than I do. They're smarter. They have more charisma. They know more. They have better resources. Really? Well, then I would say go read about Mother Teresa, and that's all I'm going to say about that. You see, jealousy creates this profusion of excuses to not point people to Jesus. Well, I'm afraid to say anything, because what if I say something wrong? I don't have the talent to do this. So what do we do? We pray that God will send someone else to that person. But that's your opportunity to point someone to Christ. It doesn't take much. So friends, there's really no room for jealousy in the kingdom of God. Paul, in our reading from 1 Corinthians 3, says that when we act in jealousy and strife, we're acting like mere humans. And maybe you're sitting there right now going, well, I hate to tell you this, but I am just a mere human. Hey, I get that, because I feel that way too. But here's a reminder for all of us. If you are a follower of Christ, if your life is surrendered to his lordship, then you are no mere human. You are a child of God, filled with the same Holy Spirit that was in Christ, and you are a new creation. You are no longer just a mere human. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ, sent on a mission. Now look, I know it's tough to not be jealous. I know how difficult it is to not long for the things that other people may have or the gifts they may possess. And God knows that we struggle, okay? So when you feel those things, just remember who he is. That all that anyone has and all that you have is simply what God has given to them. And remember who you are. Now, you're not the Messiah, but you are a spirit-filled child of God who knows the Messiah. So point others to him that he would increase as you would decrease. Amen. Together, as a sign of unity with the church throughout history and all believers today, we now pray as our Lord Jesus first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.